um, from the very last position, Mike, that we have not talked about is the quarterback spot. Uh, the least suspenseful, I think, uh, situation we have here on the offense. Uh, Dylan Gabriel entrenched as the starter. Obviously, that's, uh, that is certainly well-deserved. Uh, last year, 29 touchdown passes, only seven interceptions. Threw for 3,600 yards, almost 60% completion percentage. He's obviously entrenched as the starter, rightfully so. Um, we talked about this earlier off the top. No Daryl Mack. That means Quadri Jones, um, from what we understand, will slide into the uh, the backup quarterback spot which is good for Quadri. He is still yet to throw an incomplete pass in his UCF career. Um, last year he was three for three. He was one for one the year prior, so he's four for four with two touchdowns. All in all, uh, doing pretty pretty good from that perspective. But listen, the 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 you know, the coaches and the and the, and the team, uh, from what the little we hear and some of the snippets you hear, they rave about what Quadri's done, and you know it feels good for that kid. Right, he, he was a walk on, uh, actually left UCF. I think he actually signed someplace else. Actually, I think he went to campus someplace else. Uh, turned around, drove back to Orlando. Was like, nah, I'm staying here. And uh, and look, it paid off. Now he's the uh, the backup quarterback. But third string, Mike. I don't know where we go here. Uh, so here are the options for the third string spot. You have one Parker Navarro, who uh, as a true freshman out of Arizona, and then you have Mackenzie Milton, who we still don't quite yet know where he's at. Heupel did say that he wouldn't be ready for Week One. Um, so that's the quarterback spot, Mike. What do what do we do here? So Gabriel Jones, <laughs> and then what? Uh, we're talking about having the best player we've ever had <laughs> in our school's history as our third string quarterback. Is that what we're saying right now? Yes. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that is the case. <laughs> that is the case. Uh, Dylan Gabriel with a phenomenal freshman year. He didn't even start the first game of the year, but came in early in the in the first half and looked sharp right away. And won the starting quarterback job by week two. And then he was the man for the whole year. Looked really good, man. The kid looks like he's got – he's the total package. He's got it all. He can throw. Maybe well, – uh, I guess we were all debating last year if, we if Hypo was holding him back from running. But he did start to show later in the year that he was – he we could take off a little bit and run with it. I don't know if we want him to do that. I don't think we need him to do that. But it, the, the ability is there. Um the, uh, Quadri Jones, like you said, has not thrown an incomplete pass. <laughs> 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 when do you even see that out of a backup quarterback? He's got a uh, QB rating in like the 500. Um, and he's capable of playing. I, I think the team has come out and said that they're comfortable. If anything were to happen to Dylan Gabriel, everybody's comfortable with Quadri Jones taking over and not missing a beat. And with all the weapons he has, and the talent that he has, I'd still feel good about about our chances on any week. Yeah. So, um, and then you got Mackenzie Milton, who, like I said, is the goat of UCF football. If he can get healthy enough to play, he's gonna see time. <laughs> whether he starts or whether he comes in and mop the duty later in the year, it's not like he's not gonna have weapons to throw to. He's gonna come in and be throwing the ball to Deontay Marks and and handing it off to Bentavious Thompson and these guys, and the offense is still gonna be flowing, man. Um, but the, the season's going to go as Dylan Gabriel goes, I guess. You know, last year he threw seven interceptions all in the games we lost. If he can clean those up, and a lot of that too was getting pressure on him. That Pittsburgh game, he was getting knocked around early, and he was just throwing the ball around. Same thing in the Cincinnati game. If the, the offensive line gives him the extra second or two, he, he's just going to pick people apart. And if we see the jump in that sophomore year that McKenzie made from his freshman to sophomore year, forget it. I mean, we may be talking about Dylan Gabriel, um, Heisman candidate for the next couple of years, Dylan Gabriel statue in front of the stadium, Dylan Gabriel national champion. All these are all dreams right now, but it could be reality. And this year is the year where we really start to see him come out of it and make a name for himself nationally. I should also note that uh, Gaston Moore is the uh, walk on. He's, he's serving in the, the Hayden Kingston role, I guess, for this year as they, uh, as the as the walk on quarterback, the green jacket, uh, the green jacket guy, the green jacket. I don't know. I don't know if that's a passing him, uh, passing the torch situation. We should we should you know, hook up with uh, Hayden, find that out. I think t- two things that I um, I'll comment on. So one, uh, you got to feel really good for Quadri because again, he's a kid. He, he walked on. He's from Orlando. Wanted to stay home. Walked on to UCF. Probably could have gone to some smaller schools. You know, obviously, then uh, you know you get McKenzie there. You got Dylan Gabriel there. Brandon Winbush comes in. Daryl Mack is there. Right? There's just a bunch of people in front of you, and he, he buys his time by all accounts. 
um, you know, did everything we're supposed to do and then said, okay, let me, let me look someplace else, you know, got there. And after a day, instead of being like, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick this out, was like, no, nah, this is where I need to be. Got back to Orlando, kept working, didn't complain. And, uh, and look where he's at, right? He's in a position now where, you know, he, he may get some significant minutes this year. And if knock on wood, anything happens to Dylan Gabriel, I think the entire team feels comfortable that that Quadri can step in there. So you got to feel good about Quadri um, and feel good for Quadri in terms of what he's been through. And with, with relation to Dylan Gabriel, I think you mentioned quarterbacks taking that, you know, that second year leap. I think the other important thing is going to be how much is Hypo going to let Gabriel do this year? I think it was very early on in the season. It was pretty apparent that Gabriel was kind of one read and, and, and go kind of guy, right? Um, a lot of that's Hypo's offense too, right? Quick reads, get the ball out of your hands, get it to the playmakers, move on. Um, but is Hypo going to loosen a little bit of the reins and, and let Dylan, you know, have more control of the offense and more control over, you know, where he throws the ball and let him have a couple different reads? Will the offense adjust to uh, to allow that to happen? Will, it, will we be more multiple in what we do? I think it's going to be really interesting, that dynamic, um, because we we saw a little bit uh, of it with McKenzie. I feel like the McKenzie offense that that ran under Hypo obviously was way different than the Dylan and the Gabriel offense that ran under Hypo. So will will we get a little bit more of that? What role does um, you know does the new co offensive coordinator Anthony Tucker who's been there obviously, but Golesh coming in? Uh, I think the coaching around Gabriel in the year two will be just as interesting because I think we see the talent, but you know will they kind of let the reins off him? Um, and, you know, will he be able to kind of have the ability to, to make that leap that we saw from McKenzie? I guess that'll ultimately be um, a big thing to look out for this year. All right. And how much will he move around in the back, you know, escape the pocket? That's the thing that made McKenzie the greatest, is the ability to take a bad play when he was getting pressured and run around for a couple of seconds and then find an open guy or just take off with his legs. It's hypo telling him not to do that because one, he was scared after seeing what happened to McKenzie, mm. or two, just because he was a freshman and he didn't trust him to to do that, and he wanted to keep his eyes downfield and just try to make plays. We'll find out more this year, and I don't think we can play scared, but at the same time, we we got do have to be careful with this kid because he is the future man. Well, similar to the tight end, I think you have to you have to keep him honest. You have to let the defense know that's a possibility that. You know, if we if we you know crash down on the back on on the mesh point, that Gabriel's going to take the ball and run with it. Like you have to keep that possibility in the back of the head of the defense because if if you don't, then obviously you know that's easily easily defended. So I don't, I don't know that we want him to run as much, but I think we have to have the the tape and the film to show that he will and he can if he needs to. And I think ultimately that'll be hopefully when we use him in spots. I I, I hope I think Heupel's done with this offensive you know, quarterback draw sneak kind of thing. I think that was a Mac package. Um, and I, maybe that he's kind of, you know, evolved from that, but you know, Gabriel's got to keep him honest every now and again, if, if they're going to give him, you know, that, that whole side of the, of the line, just make sure he slides better than he did a few times last year. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll come out on top. And then really quickly, Mike, the specialist, um, I think we know Andrew Osteen will be the punter. Um, you know, he had a solid year. He, he wasn't used all that much. Um, you know, solid year. Hopefully he continues to get, to get better. Alex Ward will be the long snapper again, uh, a, a position you don't know his name until all of a sudden we don't have one. And then all of a sudden it's a big issue, but uh, Alex Ward has been back there uh, for a second season. Now I think he'll, he'll be fine. The kicking game. Uh, when Hypo brought this up, Mike, he, uh, he mentioned Obarski and how, how well he'd kick. So I got to believe Obarski is nailed down the kicking job. Um, and, uh, and we'll see how that works out. Obviously he's got the leg. Uh, does he have the accuracy? I think will be the important part there. All right. We, we talked about it how many times last year with the kickoffs out of bounds. We didn't get to see him kick too many field goals. Dylan Barnes did a good job back there last year. So we're going to get a shot to see him. Uh, I mean, our offense doesn't kick a lot of field goals, to be honest. But there is going to be a game at some point this year where whether it's a field goal to win it at the end or a field goal right before halftime to change momentum of a game like we saw in Memphis in 2018, or there's going to be a big kick at some point in this year, and can this kid hit it? That's that's going to be the thing. I mean, he doesn't have to be the greatest kicker of all time. Like I said, we score touchdowns more times than not. But there is going to be one or two times this year where we're going to depend on Obarski, and he's either going to be the hero or he's going to be the goat. Just That's the life of a kicker, and hopefully he's up for the challenge. Um, Osteen, a good year last year, young kid, and you always like to see progression out of him. So these guys look solid for now. Until they're not. That's the thing with special teams. <laughs> yep. You're good until you're not anymore. Yep. <laughs> right. So um, we're going to find out, man. And, and there's nothing else we can do. Just wait and see. It. Sometimes 
guy, I had a baseball coach used to call it white line fever. I mean, guys are great in practice. And then you get into the game, you get in between those white lines, and all of a sudden you can't do it anymore. So maybe Obarsi may struggle with that. Who knows? We're going to find out. So hopefully he's, he's the kicker we're looking for. If not, we got guys behind him ready to go. And then we got the return game, Mike. The kick return, uh, largely last year, handled by Adrian Killens. He had the most kick returns. Two other guys that actually had kick returns or credited on the on the team were uh, Marlon Williams and Mentavious Thompson. Um, so I don't know where we go kick return wise. Obviously, we've got a ton of speed. We talked about O'Keefe. We know Kevin Ahmad uh, is fast. We know Jalen Robinson is fast. Uh, Bentavious Thompson obviously is a is a freight train. I don't know where we go kick return, Mike. I, I think you give Jalen Robinson a, a crack at it. Maybe you keep uh, Bentavious back there. I don't know where you go kick return. Then punt return, Otis Anderson was our, our primary punt return guy last year. 21 uh, returns. I think Marlon was his backup. He had four returns. Um, Otis only had the one touchdown only, but only had one touchdown against Pittsburgh. But I'm curious if they keep Otis back there, Mike. I, and we're going to ask so much from him on offense. I think last year and, and the year prior, there was a concerted effort to kind of get the ball in his hands because he's a playmaker. You know, if that changes, you know, do we want to risk him out there, you know, on, on some of these punt returns as well and, and keep him healthy and keep him – um, you know, keep him fresh for the offensive side. So do we try a Jalen Robinson? Do we try a uh, Ryan O'Keefe? Does somebody else maybe take the, the, the punt return jobs? No, uh, no information there, Mike, but it'll be interesting to see who ends up uh, lining up back there because as, as, as we saw with the Mike Hughes era, you know, special teams and, and return touchdowns and a threat to return, particularly on punt returns, kick returns, you can just, you know, high, you know, uh, on a high five it. Uh, you can just fair catch that thing and get the ball at twenty five. It seems like that's the, the new norm. Punt returns, though, I mean, that's a that's a game breaking opportunity. Have we not had a kickoff return for a touchdown since the reservation for six in the last think, two years? Right? I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. And that is a some that's a staple of UCF special teams going all the way back. Smoking and, Joe. <laughs> yeah, way even before Smoking Joe. I, but Smoking Joe was great. You're right. But um, yeah. We don't know what to expect out of these guys. Otis, if he wants to punt return, put him back there. You know that he was good at it. He, we saw what he could do against Pittsburgh. He has had a couple of muffs here and there, but he's, if he gets that cleaned up, I mean, the guy is dangerous. He can score on any kick. Um, kickoffs. There's a list of guys to go with. And if Jalen Robinson has experience, he wants to do it. Put him back there. I, I, I don't even know who to pick from. Hmm. So much speed. There's <laughs> so much speed. They're all interchangeable guys. And you can't be worried about guys getting hurt because, like I said, if somebody does happen to get hurt, we have plenty of guys to come in and, and fill the roles of running backs or receivers or whoever, whoever it is back there. So put the best guys back there, the best, the guy that gives you the best chance to get scoring position and the guy that is safest with the ball. Do, whoever doesn't fumble. That's what I want. That's the worst thing you can do yeah. is, is muff a kick and give the other team the ball right there. With our offense, we can score in under two minutes from anywhere on the field. So just catch the ball, and if you score a touchdown, great. If you get a 50-yard return, great. But if you don't turn it over, that is the most important thing. Well, we'll see, Mike. That is, uh, I don't know where else you're going to get an hour-long uh, position-by-position uh, depth chart breakdown than right here in the Suns UCF. We'll see how close we are to getting this right. Uh, depth chart should come out uh, sometime in the next uh, seven days-ish. Seven ten days, so hopefully we'll we'll get a chance to see. I know Hypel does that thing though, where he says, you know, person A or person B or <laughs> person C. So you may never really get to know. And obviously, with all the talent we have, uh, there there's some you know some multiplicity that can take place. I think the positions that were, you know, I think you and I highlight that we're most concerned about are the defensive backfield, what we what we have there, uh, and the offensive line, and kind of what that rebuilds. So I guess those are those are two spots that we will keep a close eye on as it gets closer to game time. But coming up next. A staple of the Sons of UCF is also the weekly pick segment. We're doing something a little different this year, and um, Mike will come back and we'll explain to you exactly what we're doing and how you can get involved. Stick around, Sons of UCF. Coming right back at you. Mike versus everybody. All right. Mike versus everybody. I think that's what we called this segment a few years ago. I forget. We have so many sounders here. Uh, but uh, if you're new to the proceedings, uh, last year we had the, the good fortune of each week bringing on a, a celebrity prognosticator, celebrity guest, if you will. And, uh, and Mike and this person would go back and forth and pick out a couple of games. I don't, I don't know how you fared last year, buddy. Do you, do you remember your record off the top of your head? Ah, last year was not as good of a year as the first year. The first year I did pretty well. I think the first year I was you know, six, seven games over 500 
which you will take as a gambler. Last year, I had a, a few rough stretches. I know there's a couple of 0-3 weeks mixed in there. Wow. 